Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBocco. I have the good fortune of directing our environmental change and security program here at the Wilson Center. It's our great pleasure to be hosting today's session. We're doing that both with our environmental change and security program as well as our Middle East program. And so on behalf of Hale Asfandiari, our Middle East program director, and Jane Harmon, the president, director, and CEO of the Wilson Center, it gives us great pleasure to be facilitating a discussion in, that we've entitled Tunisia Predicted Demography and the Probability of Liberal Democracy in the Greater Middle East. Um, we at the Center in the Environmental Change and Security Program uh, since 1994 have been facilitating this kind of dialogue between uh, issues of population demography, environment, development, health issues, and trying to understand them in a broader foreign policy and security policy context. And so in this context of demography and security that we're talking about today, uh, fits right in that tradition, a tradition of the Wilson Center as a nonpartisan, non-advocacy forum reflecting uh, President Wilson's legacy as our only president to have a PhD, trying to bring together folks with, with different perspectives to debate these, um, these key issues that are very policy relevant, but also are uh, benefiting from the insights of the worlds of research. And so that's what we're doing uh, today in hearing from Richard Sincata. Rich is somebody who has contributed to this demography and security literature for many years. He's uh, at the Stimson Center now, a demographer in residence. We're pleased to have him working with us here at the Wilson Center uh, as well. And then notably, he has also uh, served as demographer in residence of the National Intelligence Council, where he was looking at demography and environmental issues in terms of their long-term trends work. Um, which ties into our discussant and our second speaker, Matt Burroughs, who was the counselor um, at the National Intelligence Council, also director for analysis of the production staff. Uh, Matt is somebody who has been really looking at these large trends that have included demography and environmental issues, energy issues, technology issues, and tried to understand what they mean for literally the world's future and specifically for the national security of the United States. Uh, Matt has been the leader in authoring the global trends um, uh, the Global Trends Reports, which are very significant reports done by the NIC every four years for the incoming administration. And he and his colleagues have really exhibited tremendous leadership in, in doing the hard work of thinking through how these complex set of issues are connected. Um, it's, we often are in our silos, uh, but Matt and the NIC under, under his leadership for, these, for this work is really doing the hard work and trying to understand how they, how they connect. Um, uh, in, in, in this case, understanding uh, demography, um, stability, security, and then uh, as Rich will walk us through his age structure model, understanding what that means for prospects uh, for democracy. I should say this meeting, like so many, uh, we are uh, able to do under our HELPS project, which is Health, Environment, Livelihoods, Population, and Security Project. It's a new five-year program that we're engaged with here at the center uh, with the generous support from USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. So it's tremendous um, that they are uh, helping make this possible yet again uh, for us to have this discussion. We are webcasting uh, the event live as well as uh, uh, C-SPAN and, and others. And so what that means for us in the room is when it comes time for the Q&A, uh, if you could just wait for one of my colleagues to bring you the microphone so that you can pose your question and folks uh, online can hear it um, as well. So I'd like to turn the floor over first to Rich, and he'll make his presentation. Matt can make some comments, and then we'll uh, all come up on the stage and have a Q&A. So Richard, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My principal objective today is to get you to try to believe me, actually, that I wasn't lucky. And, um, but, but I was indeed very fortunate. The work had, could only have been produced if I had three excellent influential organizations that were in my corner and three people that uh, were in those organizations and still are. The first is the National Intelligence Council, known as the NIC or the NIC. For three years, I was fortunate to, to serve as a member of the NIC's Long Range Analysis Unit, which is a small group uh, that was set up in 2006 uh, to locate or produce conceptual models uh, that would anticipate global trends over the next two decades. 
Now, it was an unconventional unit. It produced unconventional products, and this, one, uh, this, this product today is one of them. If one goes to the, uh, the National Intelligence Council's website, one can find the LRA product, principal product, which is Global Trends 2025, a transformed world, which was published in 2009. Uh, reference to this prediction on North Africa appears in there on page 64 in the bottom. And therefore, I thank Matthew Burroughs uh, and the LRAU for, uh, for educating me and allowing me to work there. The second organization I'd like to thank is the Wilson Center Environmental Change and Security Program program that three years ago uh, published this work. It's called Half a Chance, Youth Bulges and Transitions to Liberal Democracy. And you can find that paper outside, I think. Uh, it's in volume 13. And that was published in 2008 and 9, or at the cusp of those two years. Uh, so to Jeff DeBelco, a big thank you. And also to Foreign Policy Magazine, which also published this uh, a similar article. And finally, I'm fortunate to reside at the Wilson, uh, I'm sorry, at the Stimson Center, which continues to educate me in many ways. To Ellen Leipson, the CEO there, uh, a thank you as well. To set the record straight about this presentation, it's not about me and a, pres a prediction that I made. In fact, it's about political demography and its potential. How we can understand some aspects of political history, current events, and even some aspects of the geopolitical future through demography and through using the UN population divisions, estimates, and projections. And they're available to everyone on the web. And they're an enormous uh, resource that will again be published uh, in a few months. The, uh, the presentation is also not about upending or displacing political science. It's about questioning the conventional wisdom that comes from theories and methods in political science, offering an alternative, and setting up a situation where one forces another look at, uh, at predictions made through, through political science. And I think if you've been listening to the news, you know that very few, if anyone, really anticipated this kind of change. Now, originally, the conventional wisdom that I had set this model up to, uh, uh, to confront was recent uh, information about the trends in, in democratization. For the past decade, and perhaps even a bit longer, some political scientists have argued that the third wave of democratization, which Samuel Huntington suggested, began in southern Europe in 1974 and ultimately spread to Latin America, to Eastern Europe, and then to East Asia, that it had washed up on the beach. Basically, it was over. The third wave was finished, they claimed. And I concluded in this paper that I did that using, uh, using a different methodology, a political demographic methodology, that they came to the opposite conclusion, that in fact it was simply taking a demographic lunch break. That it was, there should have been a sign out to lunch, we'll be back between 2010 and 2020, look for me in North Africa. Now, of course, neither Tunisia nor Egypt are close to liberal democracy as yet. But the regime changes which had to happen in order to get there are already in place. And this is basically the, the uh, foundation of my claim, particularly for Tunisia. That's where, the hope, that's where I rest a lot of hope in, in uh, a future liberal democracy the first in the Arab world. Now, what have analysts been saying following the beginning of demonstrations in Tahir Square when it became obvious that the Arab Spring was spreading to other parts of, the nor of North Africa and then to the Middle East? I heard one old hand at the analysis game begin with the phrase, the pattern is broken. The pattern is broken. Now, my message today is that the pattern the global pattern is still the same. Nothing has changed. Political scientists have been looking at the wrong pattern. Now, to communicate this message to you, 
I'll be rehashing a paper that is three years old and made that prediction that between 2010 and 2020, one or two uh, states in North Africa would attain liberal democracy. In other words, one or two would be assessed as free in Freedom House's annual assessment. As I've said, no North African country is there yet. It will take time to happen if it happens. A quick survey of Freedom House's database shows that over the past four decades, it has usually taken between three and eight years for a new liberal democracy to rise from Freedom House's lowest score, which is not free. That means authoritarian rule. Through partial democracies, a large category, and finally into the free category. Now, while this prediction has attracted attention to the age structural model, it's all about demography, it's all about the structure of, a, of, of the distribution of populations by age, I don't feel that the most exciting part of this is, uh, is the prediction, actually. Personally, I'm more excited about the way it has changed the way I think uh, about the evolution, the timing, and the stability of liberal democracy. And it does this by addressing uh, four questions that have been nagging democracy specialists for quite some time. The first is, why are some states unready for liberal democracy? In other words, why are some states that try to restore liberties, restore elections, likely to experience electoral violence or coup d'etat? What does unready for liberal democracy really mean, actually? Second, why is it that some groups of states, particularly European states and Japan, have so easily maintained liberal democracy? Why are they so stable? Third, why has there been a decade-long break in significant liberalization? The third wave is dead question. And finally, what are reasonable expectations for developing countries in terms of democratization? Do we want them all to be democracies? And do we want them to do that now? Perhaps when we go through these questions at the end of the, the presentation, this approach may change your understanding of political liberalization as well, and I hope so. Now let's go through the longer story, and I hope Jeff will keep me within time, because I think there could be some good questions, and I'm waiting for Matt's discussion anxiously. The method that I will take you through is focused on population age structure. As I said, the distribution by age. And you can see four age distributions here. This is Tunisia over on the left-hand corner. Upper left is uh, Tunisia 1965, very pyramidal age stru structure. Still pyramidal in 1990, uh, both of these being, I, I've called youthful age structures. They're younger than a median age of 25. 2010 is the present age structure down in the left-hand corner, and you can see a bulge, a youth bulge, at least the demographer's youth bulge, as opposed to up above, which might be called the political scientist's youth bulge, one where Fertility has declined at the bottom there, in the bottom left, where the cohorts uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the younger years are, um, are smaller. Now, you can read this, these graphs. Uh, they're basically the proportion of five-year groups in the age structure in a population. There are two... Uh, bar graphs that are turned on their side. On the left are males, on the right are females, and the percentage of the population is along the bottom. Both economic and political demographers believe that these shapes are characteristic of economic and political changes and conditions that are occurring to populations. Now, 
the Middle East and North Africa have been going through fertility decline. And here's a graph across the bottom of our years. The total fertility rate is the vertical axis. On the graph are Tunisia from the bottom. As you look at the right-hand side, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Tunisia went through fertility decline fastest and first. Algeria uh, waited a while, uh, but came down very rapidly. Uh, Egypt's fertility declined steadily, but lags behind both uh, Tunisia and Algeria. Syria and Jordan uh, are up above and started latest. And what has this done is created an age structural transition. That is the, a the demographic transition of which fertility decline is one component, force this decline, uh, this change in age structure. Now take a look at those points. Each one is a country. The pictures are appended to some of the countries along that distribution. Along the bottom of the graph is the proportion of people who are 60 and older. Along the vertical axis, are people that are under 30 years of age. So it's young versus old. And that arrow shows the direction of movement that countries are, tra are, are traveling in that transition. Up in the left-hand corner are the youngest countries. And you can see them listed, some of them. Afghanistan, Nigeria, with very pure middle age distributions. As you move down, you see Mexico undergoing dramatic changes, China, South Korea, and finally you end up with a cluster of countries, which are <coughs> Japan, it's pictured, but also Italy and, <coughs> excuse me, and Germany. Eventually, we hope that uh, countries like Afghanistan and countries in Sub-Saharan Africa will move down this transition toward the middle and later parts. But right now, they're sort of sus suspended up at the top, and that has political significance. Here's, a, here's looking at them more closely, Afghanistan up on the upper left, lots of young people, very rapid workforce growth, no place to employ those people. Tunisia has moved along at the right, 2010. And on the bottom is, is uh, left-hand corner is the United States, almost a cylindrical shape with a few bulges. One of them, the bulge that I represent, more up at the, in the Middle Ages, the uh, baby boomers. And then there's a, an echo that, uh, <coughs> of a generation that's actually in their early 20s right now. To the right is Germany in 2025, not now, but 15 years down the road, 14 years down the road, uh, a post-mature age structure where there's a, a bulge in the retired group of people, uh, an age structure that is undoubtedly going to challenge their welfare systems. And here's the Middle East. Uh, at least North Africa crossed the top, Tunisia compared with Egypt. Yemen, a very young age structure, younger than Egypt, and then the United Com Kingdom as uh, a comparison, showing you again that cylindrical, typically cylindrical uh, age structure, mature age structure that uh, one finds in most of the industrial countries today. Well, so much for the background. Now, what does this have to do with the rise and stability of liberal democracy, and I'm going to argue that it has everything to do with it. And while political scientists generally have little no knowledge of demography, they already have some of the pieces to this puzzle. And these are the two pieces. Uh, first of all, there's a Hobbesian bargain, and the Hobbesian bargain or authoritarian bargain is something that, that each of us have experienced. Thomas Hobbes talked about it in the 17th century, and he described it as the relationship that was fundamental to creating the state. Elites and citizens 
were willing to give up some of their basic freedoms to a sovereign who would protect them. And of course, a lease and property, uh, with property uh, are even more sensitive to this bargain uh, than citizens. So think of the bargain in the phrase, I give you my rights, you give me protection. That's it in a nutshell. But don't forget the other side of the bargain. We, need no, we don't need your protection anymore. You're too costly. Give us back our civil liberties and, uh, and, and political rights that we'd like to enjoy. And that's essentially what, uh, what we saw when General Amar uh, decided to protect the demonstrators in Tunis rather than President Ben Ali. Now the other piece of this puzzle is the youth bulge. And it can be easily expressed by looking at these graphs. From left to right, uh, actually it's the graph of Afghanistan uh, and the other one. <laughs> Not quite, very similar to, to, to Tunisia, however, and, uh, and the third one is Korea, South Korea. The youth bulge expresses how uh, the propensity for, for civil violence, in other words, the effort needed to recruit for political violence is lower on the left side, where the where, where age structures are very young, as age structures uh, as age structures mature, the hypothesis is that uh, political violence becomes a little bit diff more difficult to uh, uh, to pull off, to recruit for, uh, until finally it's very difficult. Now, why, why is that? First of all, it could be uh, answered in, in, in perhaps two words, young men, lots of them, moving into their early working years. And because of the rapid rate of workforce growth that's typical in those age structures, they're difficult to employ. They're easier, therefore, to recruit. Now, that rate of workforce growth in those age structures like, uh, like Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestinian Authority and many others in Sub-Saharan Africa, that rate is often two to three times uh, faster than workforce growth is in the United States. If we think we have trouble employing people, you can imagine in those countries. Or perhaps it's the vibrant politicized society that young people create. It's been called the street uh, by newscasters, but probably it's both of those. Put these two together, and I contend one has an age structural theory of democratization. And I'll show you what I mean. On the bottom of the axis is the median age. So from left to right, we have age structures maturing. And you can see those graphs across the top, those images. The benefits of authoritarianism should be higher when age structures are very young and politically volatile. This is when commercial elite and citizens should be willing to trade their political rights and civil liberties for security, for themselves, for their families, and for their property. On the other hand, net benefits for liberalization should increase as age structures mature, when political violence becomes less likely, when more people are educated, and when the social mood calms. The question for commercial elite and military elites becomes, why should we maintain this authoritarian? Why should we allow the intrusion of his family and friends into our businesses? Why should we allow him to siphon off money from customs and from our taxes? What is he protecting us for, from? His time is over. It's time for the big man to go. And I think you're, you saw that twice already in North Africa. at least in Tunisia, and I think that it's, it really is that case there. And as the countries get younger, it becomes a little bit more of a difficult question for the elites, and, and, and it takes them a little more time, and you should see that. And some, 
they split in, uh, split apart, perhaps like in, U in, in Libya. Now, why should we see, what we should see is a decrease in political violence within states as populations mature and an increase in the proportion of liberal democracies. And that's exactly what we see. So taking you back to this big graph where we saw the countries of the world moving downward through the, uh, through the age structural transition, this section over here is a zone of vulnerability that uh, in which about 80% of all civil conflicts arise every decade. So from the 70s uh, through the early 2000s, this is what we've seen. Uh, we've also seen liberal democ democracies arise in that section of the age structure, but um, the global age structures, but we, they don't stay there that long. They're sort of transient, they move out, others move in, and they're unstable. What do we see from liberal democracies? We see virtually what, uh, we, should ex what we expect. Youth youthful liberal democracies, uh, democracies are rare and they are transient. Uh, intermediates are just that. They are an intermediate class of liberal democracies as well. About half of them in that section are liberal democracies. And then in mature populations, uh, almost all of them are. There are exceptions. There's China. Uh, it's not, China's not intermediate, I'm sorry. But there's Russia, Singapore, Cuba. They've been able to retain uh, authoritarianism despite this onslaught of a changing age structure. Now, the relationship between age structure and liberal democracy works best if we look at related groups of countries. I found this when I graphed the proportion of liberal democracies in five regions of the world from 1975 to 2005. I looked at them every five years, and they virtually had the same relationship, and there it is up on that graph. As I said, the youngest, have been, the youngest uh, liberal democracies that are within the... Um, uh, African group have bounced back and forth. Uh, but in Europe, the proportion of liberal democ democracies has, has consistently remained uh, well above 80%. The other regions have stayed somewhere in between, the Americas, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and other Asian countries, the uh, Asia-Pacific countries. So what I did is I took a look at a, a sensible benchmark. That is, where is it that 50 countries have about a 50% likelihood of being a liberal democracy? And even though the errors are huge to look at individual countries, it's better to look at the, the regions. Uh, I picked that point, and I found out where that was in terms of the age structural measure, which we'll discuss right now. And then I took a look at where that uh, what happens in individual cases. So across the bottom are the years, and uh, those bars represent uh, the proportion of young adults in the, ad in the working age population, so that's an expression of youthfulness. And I guess I have something to point at this too, don't I, or not? No, it isn't, okay. The, uh, the lines, that is the, the thin lines with the little boxes, uh, are the democracy scores uh, or the freedom scores according to Freedom House. I tried this with two different databases, Polity 4 as well. And where there's a dark spot is where they've reached liberal democracy. And I think you can see some agreement, some coincidence between uh, the decline in youthfulness the bars, and the height of, uh, of the Freedom Ho uh, House scores, the occurrence of those black spots. Now, countries didn't always make it. They usually tr made a try at it. Uh, some countries, like uh, Albania and Turkey, got very close, but are not there qu quite yet. 
one country, uh, Thailand, got there and fell off. But by and large, countries that uh, experienced this decline in youthfulness, this advance in age structure, made it to liberal democracy and stayed there. In fact, the later they did it, the better off they were. Now, using this, uh, this measure, political demographies are at, uh, demographers are at, a, at an advantage because they have the UN projections at their disposal. Once you see where this 50% point is, you can look forward in the projections and see when it is we should expect a country to come into liberal democracy. Now, that doesn't mean they will do it on the nose, or that doesn't mean uh, even that they'll do it right around that spot. It's a statistical guess. There's error involved. But nonetheless, it, it's, an edu it's, it's, uh, it's an education to take a look at where these countries are expected to come in. I'm very fortunate. Tunisia says it was 2011. Now, that's a complete fluke, but nonetheless, it's uh, an impressive one for this model. Egypt, 2018. Yemen, 2045. Okay. That doesn't mean one should not work for liberal democracy or try to improve those institutions in society. It means that we should have lower expectations and gauge accordingly. Morocco, 2015. Algeria, 2014. Turkey, 2009, and it is very close. It's still partly free. Iraq, 2035. Iran, 2014. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Syria, 2025, still a long way off. And I put in Cyprus, it is a Middle Eastern country, 1986, and it came into liberal democracy in 1983, actually. Now, the countries that move through this sieve, sort of, that move through this region and don't become liberal democracies uh, are of two basic types. One of them is the kind of China type is where, uh, where the, the political elite or the party is synonymous with the state. And that may be the case in Iran as well. Uh, the other type is uh, where the leader is a, is a charismatic individual, a Fidel, um, a, a Lee Kuan Yew, a founder of a country. Perhaps something that, um, that, that Cesar Chavez has tried to cultivate but has not been successful doing. Um, but military, caretaker governments, um, sort of flavorless authoritarians of the type of Ben Ali have not lasted very long once they've hit, once the age structures have hit this point. Now, why is it that these age structures, is it all demography? And I don't think it is. Lots of things happen when demography changes. Uh, <coughs> it, uh, it tracks changes in education. Fertility and mortality have changed. There's things that we cannot measure about populations and about countries that change as the demographic uh, transition changes. Things about women, how they interact in society, uh, the value of children, uh, how education changes the way people communicate and how they address each other. But the point is that, that, that this was an easy bet, and it still is. If, if North Africa acts like any other region, developing region did East Asia before it, Latin America, then uh, there's a 97% per chance, percent chance I'm right. And juxtapose that to the claims of political scientists uh, that the revolution in Tunisia was unpredictable. I don't think so. The method uh, is different for them, but it makes some 
uh, I think, some very uh, easy conclusions uh, based upon grouping countries together and, uh, and the history of, of uh, the rise of democracy. Now let's go back and quickly answer these questions that I posed at the beginning. Why are some states seemingly unready for liberal democracy? They're too young. They're demographically too young. Why are some groups of liberal democracies so stable? Because they're demographically mature and they have all the institutions, the education, all those things that go along with demographic maturity. Why has there been a decade-long break in political liberalization? Largely because there's a dearth of countries going through this portion of the demographic transition, of this portion of the age structural transition. So when countries are not coming in, when there's a lot that are very young, as they are in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, then you're not going to see anything. You're just going to see slight movements in the very young countries and the very old countries. And it's only when they move through this section we seem to have uh, some kind of uh, changes occurring, and they're not always revolutionary changes. In fact, if you go back to the, to the early part of the third wave, 1974, Portugal and Spain were in this, in, in this uh, window of opportunity, and uh, those were, uh, Portugal was a, a, a military coup that led to a democracy, and Spain was uh, an easy transition that Franco decided to make. And uh, fourth, what are reasonable expectations for developing countries in terms of democratization? Well, I think I've been over them. Don't have expectations for, big expectations for very young countries. Uh, look at where they are in the, in, the, in the sort of pathway of the demographic transition, the pathway of the age structural transition, and, and have expectations that are in accordance. If you you have to remember back that uh, many people had big expectations for Iraq, and those expectations are not being met either for the international community or uh, for the Iraqi people. And uh, this is one clue to it. So I'm going to end with uh, looking back at the Tunisian age structure and uh, making a few brief statements about it. Um, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's wonder here for a second, why were Western political scientists so surprised by, the Af by North Africa's uh, uh, revolutions that have just passed over the last several months. And I argue that it's because they were, they had missed North Africa's more quiet reproductive revolution that preceded them, a revolution that also, that also began in Tunisia under policies put in place by Habib Bourguiba. Now the change in household composition from large families to small numbers of children is a revolutionary change not only for women and children, but also for the societies and states in which they live. And we just haven't been able to grasp that yet. Habib Bourguiba, the first president of Tunisia, demonstrated that he understood how revolutionary this change would be when, at independence in 1956, he introduced reforms that guaranteed a secular package of rights for women and proceeded uh, to uphold them throughout his, his rule. It seems that we in the West are just starting to understand the volume of Mr. Bourguiba's intentions. They are very deep, and I think this is the legacy of Bourguiba being played out. So thank you.
Well, thanks, um, Jeff, um, for inviting me. Uh, and it's really a privilege and an honor to be back here. Uh, this has been a kind of second home to uh, for the NIC when we want to come forth and, and talk about some of the ideas and theories we have. We usually uh, call on Jeff. He's one of the first ones to, to offer us a place to, to um, uh, trot out some of our ideas. Now, as um, Rich mentioned and also Jeff, um, I'm not a, I need it up here a little bit, I'm not an unbiased supporter of, of uh, Rich's research and of his work in this area. And I wanted, um, um, and I can explain a little bit more the, the kind of scholarly interest I have in, in his ideas, but what I thought I would do here is focus really on the value for, um, that we see within a government context for this kind of um, research. And want to first talk a little bit about really the, the context of that government work, and I'm thinking here about strategic foresight Jeff mentioned and also Rich, the work we do on global trends and which is really looking out 15, 20 years. And I think it's fair to say that um, while there's a general understanding and I think it within the policy and the analytic community, you know, about rapid change, uh, the, um, it's still very hard for analysts to really think about discontinuities and predict discontinuities. Um, the tendency is still to think linearly. Um, and this, um, I think, is particularly um, the case, um, too, with regional analysts who all believe their country, their region, is very unique. So with this Tunisian case, we're actually Rich didn't talk about this too much, but he's up against um, actually a, a bunch of regional analysts, both inside government and outside government, who I think believe up until recently that their uh, region was immune to any democratization. And I won't go into all of the reason for it, but that is something that also I would say a f feeling that um, I hate to use this word, but really infects also a, a lot of the, the government analysis on it. Um, the third thing, I think, is really our, our general use of narratives. And um, this is the case inside government, outside government. It's, it's, I think, how we are brought up, how we think. So people, if you were talking about Tunisia, I think the narrative that you would hear and you do hear is that well, this happened um, largely because Ben Ali didn't mobilize his security forces. He didn't crush them. Um, that was the, the really the surprise. Not, you know, that um, the understanding about, as Rich was talking about, youth structures and what pressures that brings and really the changing age structure. I mean, this is just how we are, we're not really schooled in thinking in these large structural um, forces, and it's much easier to think about personalities and to an extent about some institutions. Now, I, I don't think we should be ignoring that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but, but um, really in terms, getting back to strategic foresight, one of the real um, dilemmas we face is, I, and again, and again, it's on this discontinuities issue is, you know, when is this going to happen? Where is this going to happen? We ordinarily give long lists to policymakers of, you know, pending state failures, whatever. Um, and of course, they rightly say, well, which ones and where and when? Um, and you can't, as a policymaker, deal with, with 20, 30, and I don't know what's on the most recent um, lists um, that we see published in foreign policy, but this is, you know, has been a long-standing issue. Now, demography, and particularly the way that Rich is using it, is an extremely valuable tool for this problem. 
And I think what I've actually seen with, with Rich for some time is um, we have, I think it's yours, yeah. <laughs> go. Some Sorry. technical <laughs> interference. No, no. Somebody's sabotaging. Probably one of those analysts I don't, I've been talking about who don't like. Um, but uh, demography is one of those tools, I think, that um, we can use, and it's just not on this democracy issue. I mean, this. Um, I think Rich has done a lot of other work, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. But Demography itself, you know, you're thinking out 20, 30 years, that is about as certain as you can get. Um, it's why we actually, a lot of strategic foresight people have really gravitated to it without really knowing any as much as um, Rich does about its correlation with a lot of other trends. Um, just the fact that you have this um, certainty um, in a world really of uncertainty. The, the other thing to say is that demographically speaking, this is an extremely interesting era that we're in. So that, um, and a lot of the problems, excluding Tunisia, Egypt for the moment, that we are also dealing with have a direct relationship with a lot of demographic trends. Aging, which is something that we're already encountering here, but certainly Europe and Japan. Um, also instability. Um, Rich has done some tremendous work on the correlation between um, instability and age structure. We published, um, I think in the past two editions of Global Trends, uh, material um, that he provided on the arc of instability. And if you correlate that actually with high birth rates, there's an extremely high correlation of that. Um, and we can also say where the changes are occurring. In the last edition of Global Trends, we actually talked about um, a slightly decreasing arc of instability for some of the reasons that we've talked about it with Egypt and, and Tunisia, and that is basically that in some countries the youth, youth bulge is actually beginning to, to decline or, or, or dwindle. So using demography um, not only, a, and then you can also, a third issue I would say is on the resource question, and again this is something that Jeff and his team here have done a lot of work on when you're looking at environmental issues. One of the real pressures on water and food resources is on the demographic side. So this in, in many ways is really, um, uh, you know, the demographic age. Um, what I think, um, going back and, and thinking about, okay, how do you use this once you get an understanding which Rich has provided to us on age structures, then as a tool, how do you use it? And this is something that um, Rich has put into his papers, but I guess didn't have a chance to talk about here, and that is that, that um, it gives you insight into what is likely to happen at certain points with certain countries, but it isn't necessarily destiny. Um, and so with the Tunisia case, if we go back to that in your paper, you talked about them, uh, Tunisia having a one out of two chance roughly of a fairly smooth, and we know when we're talking about smooth transition, Chile is probably the model there, three years, but we know Indonesia, which we cite also as a success case, eight years. So we're still talking about a, um, you know, could be um, a longish period um, transition. But that gives us some idea versus in Egypt where you're talking about because of its much more youthful population, a one out of three chance. Um, and so that is, again, for our uses, extremely important to have some gauge. We obviously, from that, have to think about the personalities. You have to think about the Muslim Brotherhood, how it's going to operate. You follow all those page 
part, um, structures at the institutional level, which we're far more used to and understand, um, and also the personalities where we have a long time have a lot of focus and interest in that and the dynamics between personalities. But for a really, uh, and this is the key one, I think, um, for the business I am in, in terms of understanding, you know, the dynamics going forward and in, in, in terms of being able to provide some foresight, this demographic tool is really e essential. And what the challenge is for us in government as well, I think, as outside is understanding more its relationship with these other trends, understanding much more the dynamics. So um, come back to the first when I say I'm not an unbiased supporter, you know, thank you, Ridge, for, for the work that you have done. I do think it's had an uh, impact. And I actually think that, you know, uh, and I have had sessions at the very highest levels on this demographic, uh, these demographic issues, that there is a real appetite and interest among policymakers for understanding this, in part because it does lend a little bit more structure than just um, our usual narrative about parties and personalities and individuals. So with that, I'll conclude and i um, more than happy to pursue any of these issues um, in our di broader discussion here. certainly presents a, a different vision of analysis of what happened in Tunisia than what we would see um, in, in many contexts, although notably uh, at least at a superficial level, we're starting to see uh, the kind of recognition of the EFAL and at the, the rising expectations of this large population being part of this coalition. So in that sense, some of these issues come in a bit uh, of a rush. Uh, but why don't we throw the floor open for <coughs> questions or, or comments. As I mentioned, because we are um, uh, webcasting and broadcasting the event, I ask that you wait for one of my colleagues to bring you the microphone. Let us know who you are and pose your question. Hattie Babbitt in the middle. We'll start with Hattie. Um, uh, Hannah right there, right under the camera in the back. Um, Hattie Babbitt, former Wilson Center scholar. The um, this is a question not related to Tunisia, but related to demography, and I wonder what kind of work you have done with respect to the issue of gender, that is to say the fact that China and India, two big players in the global scene, have uh, increasingly large uh, male populations relative to their female populations and what significance that has with regard to your projections. Okay, the sex ratio question, Rich? Yeah. <coughs> I must admit I'm quite puzzled about its significance. I think uh, it sounds good. I've, I've read uh, Valerie Hudson and Adrian Den Boer's book. It's an excellent book. Uh, the argument makes lots of sense to a point, um, but it deals largely in history. That's where the verification of her model comes from. Uh, Bear Branches is a reference to uh, which is the title of the book, is a reference to uh, a period in China during the 19th century, I think it is, that uh, harkens back to a period when there was a lot of female infanticide, as there has been in both of those countries. And um, 
this male skewed age structure, which was blamed for having, uh, blamed for the, the, as the source of, uh, of lots of men who, who positioned themselves outside the, the country, in an, I'm sorry, outside of Beijing and outside of the city centers, and actually were bandits to a certain extent and extracted taxes. Um, how applicable this is to present time, I'm not so sure it, it is. You know, I don't, it's hard for me to, to see because I, remember at the same time, um, men are waiting longer to get married, so are women. Um, uh, th women marry several times. China is not without a large divorce rate uh, and divorce rates are climbing, particularly in North Africa. People know about that. Uh, so I don't know how applicable this is. It kind of assumes that women and men get married at the same age and therefore you match the cohorts, but we know that actually men get married at older ages than women or their, their partner, and as they get older, their, uh, the, 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 actually the, uh, the pool for, for men increases. Now this can't go on forever. There is, there is some uh, uh, disparity, but I don't know how applicable it is in the, in the modern sense, and I'm not so sure that we've seen any of it. A, a lot of the claims that people have seen, some kind of disturbance associated with this, uh, are all false, as far as I can have been able to tell. Um, so the wait and see, you know, we're waiting, we're seeing, and we're seeing actually some uh, the, uh, disparities in age, in, um, in uh, uh, marriage age. In fact, there's one in Eastern Germany that's been going on. It's at the level that Chinese uh, disparities will be in the next decade. Uh, the East German disparity, where there are much many more men in the in the um, marriage age than women, uh, comes from the fact that uh, East German women, upon leaving high school, uh, seek college and jobs elsewhere, elsewhere in Europe, in the West. So you have this huge disparity. And when uh, the Berlin Institute looked at political violence, they saw less of it in the East than in the West. They saw less crime. Uh, the only thing they saw was that the voting was for right-wing parties was was higher, and uh, that can be explained in other ways. That's the case for many uh, Eastern European countries that sort of have a backlash against communism. So I wouldn't jump to it as causing anything, quite, mm -hmm. quite frankly, right now. I think, Hattie, given your work at, at USAID and some of the issues around uh, trafficking, I think if we set aside some of the instability and the conflict um, as, the, as the hypothesis and look at what are those disparities going to mean in terms of some of these other dynamics that we can agree are really important and, and ones right, that we'd like to avoid. So if short on women, the kind of importation and trafficking in, in, in women in terms of bringing in from the kind of right. cro cross but, but look where it, But look where, it's going, where trafficking is occurring today. It's more associated with high income countries, Japan and South Korea, who import, if this is the trafficking you're talking about, import v Vietnamese <coughs> brides. Uh, and those, those countries don't have a disparity, you know. So I, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, but uh, I think we've jumped to conclusions quite a bit. And, um, you know, maybe in the end it will, uh, it will pan out as having a, 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 some kind of impact there. It's a moral issue, yes. Uh, um, and uh, I think that's why people are attracted to it. And we want it to be a security issue. But I think we, it may not be at all. Okay, there's a question, gentleman over here, and then we'll work down to the front. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. A very good presentation. Uh, Richard and I know, have known each other for many years. I'm Mehtab Karim. I'm currently in the faculty of George Mason University. I recently completed a, a major report for Pew Research Center on future of the global Muslim population. And in that report, uh, youth has come as a major factor. Uh, we have looked at the current uh, distribution of the youth in each of the uh, Muslim majority countries in Africa, Asia, uh, and uh, the Middle East, where about 28% of the population is between ages 15 to 29. 
and it's going to increase further to about 30 percent in the next 20 years. So the bulge, with the exception of few countries where fertility rates has uh, declined substantially, that bulge would come down, but in most of the countries it's going to increase further. Uh, so, I, so I'd like to shift from uh, North Africa to Tunisia, which is very interestingly only uh, 10 million people, and if you say 28 percent of them are are youth, a very small, tiny population as compared to the region I come from, which is South Asia, uh, particularly in Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, where uh, about uh, 180 million people in Pakistan means about 60 million young people. And that is more than the combined population of Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And so what the question I was going to raise that although South Asian countries do have some kind of democracy off and on. India has been having regular democracy, but Bangladesh and Pakistan hasn't. What would be the role of youth in those countries? A huge chunk of people, you're talking about 40 million or 45 million in Bangladesh, about 55 or between 55 to 60 million in Pakistan currently. And of course, India is more over a billion, so much, much bigger a number, I know you're talking about uh, close to, I don't know, too many, <laughs> too many. <laughs> maybe <laughs> as many as in Europe. Uh, how do you see that these youth were unemployment rate is extremely high, about um, perhaps about 25 percent among these young people. What role they are going to play uh, learning the lesson from North Africa, Tunisia, as I said, it's a tiny country. That's one question. The second one is that what I have seen in my analysis of data, that countries which are lagged behind in reducing their fertility uh, in, in the Muslim world, and uh, I could identify four or five of them, that is Yemen, uh, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan, and to some extent Pakistan, where these are the trouble countries with a lot of problems, as you know. Do you think that that's uh, the demography of these countries is going to uh, react in some way or the other in the near future? I'm very sorry for a long uh, <laughs> comment and two major questions. Thank you very much. Me again? Okay. Can we start with you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let you off the hook, no? Okay. Um, yeah, it is a difficult question, Mithap. Um, let me see. <coughs> well, South Asia is an interesting place, not only for its youthfulness, but also for its heritage of democracy in India, as you said. India is interesting because it was a democracy uh, at the end of the colonial period, and it uh, was in charge of, a, of an elite that, uh, that was, uh, it was uh, run by an elite that believes very strongly in democracy. They weren't going to let it get away. Um, <clears throat> that said, it did what many young countries do. It dropped from high levels of democracy to something less, twice, according to Freedom House. Once during Mrs. Gandhi's uh, emergency, uh, 1976 to 8, and the other time under the, in the 90s, in the late 90s. Uh, it's also had <clears throat> bouts of religious violence. It's a, it's a difficult place, but as you can see from statistics, that uh, it's most difficult in the north, where uh, <clears throat> each of those states are the size of countries, and many of them, particularly in the core of uh, the country, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Bihar, <clears throat> um, Jharkhand, I think is the other one, is that uh, uh, they're just like very youthful countries elsewhere, and, um, and one can say the same for um, the fringe part of Pakistan. And we can see that both of those places still have residual, or <laughs> not residual, but even increasing uh, of violent insurgencies. Uh, the Naxalites in India, and um, of course the Taliban, and. Uh, other smaller groups in, um, in Pakistan. Uh, South India, on the other hand, <clears throat> is a fairly peaceful place, and fertility is low, age structure has moved on, 
the cities also in both Pakistan and, and India have, uh, have uh, advanced in their age structure and produced lots of very educated people. So what you have in South Asia is this, this divided up, uh, these, these countries that are, part of them is young, part of them is old, the cities are young, uh, old, and, um, and you can have an economy that flourishes almost at the level of a, of a developed economy as an island inside a, con uh, a country that is largely poor, uh, largely very pious, religious, and very often um, uh, very violent. So um, this, this is the, the India's reality that you can go to India, and, like I did a few months ago, and, and <coughs> live in a city, Chennai, and uh, feel like you're very close to the kind of living that you have here, and yet if you fly to another uh, city, you will pass over areas that are very much uh, the developing world, very much like Asia used to be. And I think this is the future for much of South Asia. Um, and the youth in it will, uh, those who get educated, who can get educated, will come to the cities. And unfortunately, education is not the strong suit of South Asian countries. Um, you look at the budgets uh, in, in the face of population growth, which is still very rapid in North India and, and, and rapid in Pakistan, they're not keeping up. And when they don't keep up, that means uh, people go to religious and other schools that are not training them for a profession. And uh, what does that mean? That means uh, it's danger. Um, as far as Somali and, and much of Sub-Saharan Africa, the, uh, the peninsula of, um, of Arabia. Some of the Arabian Peninsula countries look like they're older because they have lots of um, labor coming from parts of South Asia. And they bring in labor that is basically in their late 20s, their mid-30s. Uh, so that makes them look older than they are. Actually, the population that is underlying the native population are very young uh, at the uh, Maybe uh, <coughs> median ages of uh, 18 or 19 for Bahrain, I think, about 19, uh, I was able to get the native population age structure. It's very different. So um, we're not looking at a future that's very promising, I think, a near-term future that's not promising, uh, and nor are we for the middle band of Africa either, from Senegal to Somalia, uh, any idea that just because there's lots of young people and they could work, <laughs> the fact is there's nothing for them and they don't work. Uh, and agriculture, meanwhile, is becoming less and less an opportunity for those, those young people. So if it's not going to absorb labor, what is? And as one person told me, you know, it's the, the uh, you just hold up an AK-47 and that is an opportunity for some people, and that's sad, and that, but that's the way it is. Matt, you want to talk about the South Asia yeah, context? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, all those, just not South Asia, but I mean, this is ban, and we talked about that in Global Trends, where the birth rate remains high. It's not very, you know, propitious um, circumstances or conditions for rapid development. On the other hand, I mean, you know, if you do look at the long-term trends on conflict, I mean, they do go down um, and have been going down in the 90s and that you could correlate that with, uh, you know, many more peacekeeping efforts. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it has gotten, you know, lifted the country up beyond kind of this <laughs> minimalist uh, level. but. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, they're, um, they're foreordained to, to um, collapse into civil war. I mean, um, it does mean, however, I think that for the international community that this will be a long-term effort and one that, um, because of the age structure, may have a lot of discouraging results for some time. I mean, certainly not quite live up to what we would hope or what our expectations are. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Rich, if I can uh, jump in with a question. Uh, you've, you alluded to this briefly in your presentation, but can you say a word about uh, this kind of um, commonly held view that in part is associated with uh, religion in the area and this kind of notion that they're locked in and not likely to change is that, um, I want to ask you about the Iran example as an illustration that it runs counter to what is often framed as a uh, kind of no change locked in, in part pointing to the challenges around the status of women and, and access. But is that kind of, uh, have we seen that as a inevitable and unchangeable uh, situation, particularly as connected to, to total fertility rates? Right. <clears throat> Most people look at Iran, they see an uh, Islamic Republic, that, which it is, but they have no idea that actually the fertility rate in Iran is lower than that of the United States. It's under two, probably, and, uh, and this <coughs> was, uh, this whole transition occurred uh, after uh, the change in government during the Islamic Republic. Uh, actually, at the, during the, um, <clears throat> the Iraq-Iran War, uh, there was an uh, explicit policy of trying to boost the fertility rate. And Khomeini, I told Khomeini believed that he needed more soldiers, that this was good for the nation. But when this war ended <clears throat> in 1988, uh, the new constitution guaranteed that all young Iranis would uh, obtain an education, health care for free, and the finance minister, looking at the fertility rate, looking how rapidly the country was growing, decided that this was impossible, that this was going to bankrupt the country, oil reserve, uh, <coughs> the oil uh, industry was in a shambles. So out of the woodwork came uh, several uh, public health officials, public health managers who actually uh, were in the family planning program prior to uh, the Shah's, uh, the revolution that overthrew the Shah. And they were uh, in a program that was sponsored by USAID. It was not an overly successful program, but what it did for many years was train a cadre of people who knew the <clears throat> who knew about family planning, who knew where to, um, how to run uh, uh, services. And it happened to be the run-up to the 1994 conference in Cairo. So there was a lot of thinking in the international community about what a, what a good family planning program would look like. Uh, so they coupled up with the finance minister. They ran um, a kind of campaign to both the mullahs, the religious community, also to the public. They had radio programs where women called in and people argued about whether this was a good idea to, um, for an Islamic republic to have small family size. And, uh, and within um, less than two years, they had a designs for a program which they instituted, and uh, it is basically a decentralized program where, uh, <clears throat> where women run rural health houses and urban health houses. I don't know what they're called in the urban areas, but it was largely successful. I mean, there were other reasons that uh, uh, fertility came down, not only the services, but services are necessary. Uh, you also have a, a, a very well-educated uh, middle class that has expanded, and also very educated women. Women outpace men in uh, educational attainment. So with this, fertility uh, declined rapidly, and it was the fastest decline of fertility um, yet recorded. And uh, if you would <laughs> look at uh, Iran's age structure, you would see something that is uh, just behind behind Tunisia's and a similar shape, very large bulge because many young people are going through the early part of their adulthood. Um, and, uh, and you will see, a the, like Tunisia, you're going to see some advantages for a while at least, and that is a decline in workforce growth that will make both 
it easy for Tunisia and easy for uh, uh, Iran to employ people. And also, you're going to get this growth, rapid growth in, in human capital, education, easy to do, small cohorts, and uh, demographic bonus, probably uh, increases in economic growth. Lots of good things will happen for a, a while uh, for both Iran and Tunisia. Okay. There's a lady here, and then we'll come down here and then move around. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Rida Timsah, and I'm a doctoral student in demography at Maryland, so I very much appreciate this discussion. But I was wondering, um, when you were talking about the rise and stability of democracies and how that relates to underlying demographics, why you've excluded Lebanon. And Lebanon <laughs> is a liberal democracy. Uh, it has a strong history, not without its challenges. But um, I guess the first question is why you've excluded it. And then more importantly, if we did put it back in the discussion, how would it inform our understanding of the stability of democracies? Especially if we look at it from a demographic perspective that, according to the latest UN statistics, total fertility period rates are at replacement. Thank you. Okay. Rich, I think seeing as many questions as we have, what we'll do is, is capture a few, okay. but we get that down. So if we can come down front, Hannah, right in, and then we'll go to the gentleman here, here, and then move to the back. Just make a circle around. Hi. Charge and Brilliance Correspondent, Bethesda Manning. Thank you, you both are coming. Uh, I have a couple of questions for Dr. Richard Sincota. Uh, first is this, how do you define that uh, elite and citizen? Uh, are elite uh, if, if is part of citizen? And also in a country, actually, security and, and the freedom not uh, run against each other. Uh, second is this, I think a Tunisia case and the Egypt case, both are improved that uh, your model are right. Uh, you said Tunisia, you predict is uh, two, uh, 2011, and uh, that's why in Tunisia it's uh, so easy. But uh, in Egypt, you say it's uh, 2018, so it means uh, Egypt not ready yet, so that's why I have a, have a couple of difficulty. And uh, in my prediction, I think Egypt have, have a long, hard road to go. Uh, I think the prospect is, uh, is not good. And uh, you, are, you are using Freedom House, uh, what's it it's, uh, called, Freedom Index? Uh, freedom Scores, right. Freedom, freedom Score, mm -hmm. okay. I don't know much about it. But uh, I do know the Harris Foundation have a so-called uh, uh, economy index. I think you might try to use the index to see what happened. Because as I see, both in Tunisia and Egypt are really is uh, economy driven events because there's a lot of unemployment. Thank you. Okay, if you could pass it to the gentleman right there. So do we see he, he, should I, he writing it down? Mm -hmm. Hi, Midshipman Hicks from the United States Naval Academy. How strong is the domino effect on igniting change on countries throughout the region? So in other words, does the fact that so many surrounding nations, uh, the fact that so many surrounding nations have had protests, does that change your statistics on probability of becoming free? Um, specifically with regards to nations that are kind of on the verge of had smaller scale protests such as Iran. Does it, so does the domino effect change your statistics of probability? Thank you. Okay, so why don't we take those. We had Lebanon, the distinction between elites and citizens, uh, kind of how the oh. Egypt 2018 and then this domino effect question. Okay. Did you want to start? First with Lebanon, well, according to Freedom House, it isn't a liberal democracy. Okay, so, um, but it's a good case because the youth bulge model is one that says at the national level uh, that uh, youthful, country, youth, youthful age structure is, is probably going to, uh, is likely to, or I should say countries are prone to the civil violence if they have this uh, age structure. And when Lebanon had that type of age structure, that was around the 1970s, really uh, does suggest that it may have been uh, a 
factor at least. Uh, the, the issue with Le uh, Lebanon is that uh, it has three or more um, ethnic groups whose fertility transitions have occurred at different paces. And if you are familiar with Joe Shamey's work from 1980s, he actually noted that uh, the Shiite population uh, was going through the demographic transition much slower than either the Christian or Sunni population or the Druze. Um, and what that has done is actually lagged this population and allowed it to grow at a rate that is more rapid than the other, uh, uh, I guess everyone's a minority now, uh, minorities. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I think that may have something to do with, uh, with the ease that, uh, with which Hezbollah has been formed. I would not, you know, the political marginalization, the, the economic marginalization of the Shiite uh, population is also very important. But um, here you have this marginalized population that remain very young, very easy to recruit, uh, and uh, meanwhile, the country is sort of suspended uh, in a form of democracy, a partial democracy, <clears throat> that just can't make the final jump to very high levels. And that's what I'm talking about, these vi very high levels. <clears throat> when I say that, don't forget that the United States did not, through its revolution, did not jump into a liberal democracy. I mean, we had a very small, fr uh, limited franchise, and we had slavery for the first 84 years of our existence, and nor did the French Revolution or one of those other revolutions end up in democracy either. So, so um, and this is a point, uh, revolutions with the intent on getting representation as the one in the 70s did, uh, securing some kind of representations, a new constitution, violent rev revolutions very rarely, if ever, end up in high levels of democracy. Uh, and instead, they usually are replaced by partial democracies or worse, uh, another authoritarian. And the other one? Uh, you want to talk about the difference in terms of the 2018 projection for Egypt based on the model yeah. and kind of what that means for its prospects? Right. I mean, the model is a tool. You know, I don't, <laughs> to take every model projection uh, as, uh, as the time when this, population is going to reach liberal democracy would be overstating it. It really is supposed to be a tool with which we can argue with people who, as Matt said, have an area of perspective or are kind of locked into ideas about uh, personalities and how governments have run and, with, and, and are not observing sort of global trends that may um, be at work in the country and not be evident. Uh, I think there's other reasons besides the model to look at Tunisia and believe that it is going to be a liberal democracy. Just the, the way the society is. Just look in the streets, actually. Look at the demonstrations. What you see is a, mixed, is a very mixed group. Women in the street, older people, the kind of thing you see in color revolutions that happen typically at older, uh, in older age structures. Egypt, you're right. Egypt is a younger country. Actually, I would have thought not only from the, yeah, from the model, essentially, that there would have been more violence. Uh, and I would think that it would have a difficult time getting to an end state of a liberal democracy, just like you said. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't. There's a lot of things that this model doesn't handle very well. And, um, and it's up to the Egyptian people and how they negotiate the next, uh, the next decade, as, as Matt said. You know, Indonesia, eight years it took them to get there. Uh, so let's watch and see. And then that ties into the domino effect question. I might pass this one off to Matt because the model doesn't handle it at all, but uh, some of the work that the National Intelligence Council does. I, I, I mean, I do think there is a domino effect, and I think it's probably heightened by actually the media revolution in the Arab world and one of the I mean, there's been a lot of talk on Twitter and, and uh, Facebook, but, you know, one of the big forces probably when people look back is Al Jazeera and the fact you have these images that are 
reflected right across the Arab world and the fact, too, that Al Jazeera has portrayed this as just not individual country revolutions, but a whole uprising throughout the Arab world. Um, and I think that does have a, a big part to play. But I, you know, there's, you go back historically, patterns, I mean, Egypt has always felt that it, it's a leader and in some senses, um, the fact that Tunisia had this revolution before it did, um, some people see as propelling it towards um, really ousting uh, Mubarak. Um, so I, I do think, you know, it's unclear exactly the extent of the domino, but I think we can say um, from what we know now that there certainly is, and it will continue. And the Farage Foundation. Oh, oh yeah, I, I don't know anything about that uh, database, I, but I would not, you know, I, I, and what, I, what I've said about this age structure is that it tracks a lot of things. You know, when social scientists look at this model, the first thing they say is, oh, one variable, how can that be? Well, I would argue that age structure is more than that. Yes, it's about fertility, mostly. Yes, it's about mortality, secondly. Um, but it also tracks human capital changes and economic changes. And don't forget that, that changes in age structure are affected by economics, but they also affect economics. The, the demographic bonus, the fact that you've got lots of people in the working age and, you've <coughs> and savings tend to rise, seems to have had a, a large effect on uh, the countries of East Asia in particular, but also Ireland and some others. Okay, we got a lot of questions. Let's get to them. So the gentleman right here will move up the chain. Hi, I'm Chris Valvari with the Public International Law and Policy Group. Uh, I was wondering in the countries as they've passed through this age structure transition um, and either haven't survived the, the transition to liberal democracy or have taken it longer, if there's any correlation between, um, for one thing, wealth, be it a, a, a resource-rich state and the way they distribute wealth, and the other factor would be uh, rule of law, um, strength of constitution, codification of civil rights, uh, citizens' rights, things like that. Thanks. Okay, if you go back a couple rows, Hannah. I suppose I don't know anything about My name is Stephen Shore. Um, my, I have two brief questions. The first is how do you explain the relative quiescence of Morocco? Is its population structure that much different from that of Tunisia? And the second, any thoughts about the future of China based on your model? Okay, a couple of big questions. There's a gentleman in the middle there, same row. Benjamin Mayne, United States Naval Academy. Afghanistan is shown as in the uh, youthful stage. I was wondering how would this demographic affect our uh, attempts to develop a culture of liberal democracy in that country, and also as well in Iraq, as the model predicted 2035 was when we would reach that 50% threshold. Um, how would this, how would our uh, seemingly premature injection of a liberal democracy culture in that country be affected by this model and how this model counter affect that. Okay, why don't we get one more. There's uh, just Hannah giving you a workout here on the right side of the room. Uh, Caleb Cronick, United States Naval Academy. You've almost reached your initial goal of convincing me that you may be right. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, I would like to know what do you see as your key limiting factors in using this model for analysts or for predicting what may happen in the future? Good, very good question. Thank okay, you. Rich, so we had the wealth and rule of law, Morocco, China, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and uh, limiting factors. Yeah, wealth and rule and law, of, of rule of law. I don't, know, I don't know anything about, basically. I don't want much besides my own reading. And I've tried to limit this to a tool that can easily be used by analysts. So what you're talking about are real factors on the ground, and what I'm talking about is something that an analyst can pull out and make a, I don't want to say a snap judgment, but actually have something that might be counterintuitive, which this was, which this was you see. It is a tool, and, and as, as Matt said, it, it, it really is best when it's in an environment where there are people who are area specialists, people who uh, know a lot about personalities and movements, and then it should be part of the mix. Uh, it, it, it really hasn't become part of the mix because I think 
many people are kind of set in their ways. Matt said that as way. well. Can I, can I follow up with Matt on this question too? Because um, certainly the NIC and the Global Trends product has been one that has brought these different types of expertise together. And I know you've also been active in talking to counterparts in other countries who are engaged in similar process. Are you seeing uh, a, a rise or any change in terms of uh, this kind of integration of work or is it that there are still relatively few doing it or recognition that folks would like to but aren't, aren't there yet? How, how do you see this uh, kind of analysis uh, developing? No, there is quite a, a bit of recognition. In fact, in May 22nd, 24, we're holding a conference um, out at Early House where we've invited Russians, Chinese, um, Brazilians, South Africans, several different European um, countries um, to a conference who are doing their own global trends. The Russians uh, think tank closely associated with some in the elite MMO is going to actually be doing a public rollout of its global trends where, of course, you can imagine demography figures mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, so I think this lesson um, has been learned, I think in part because in some ways policymakers may be um, in front of the analysts. Um, I think they, um, you know, on a demographic level, they, I think they have a better sense possibly because if you think of how they come to power anywhere, they usually have to know demographics in their party and mm -hmm. who they're <coughs> appealing to. Um, but I think there's more importantly a sense of just the rapidity of change that is happening and the uncertainties. Mm -hmm. So and the more that you can't obviously forecast exactly what is going to happen, uh, but you can give them some sense of the parameters. So what, um, like I was saying before, sense of in Egypt the chances of one and three or Tunisia and one and two, I mean, what actually you are up against. And that's oftentimes for them very helpful to get that sense of what, what they need to do or what they can or can't do. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to say a word about uh, Morocco. What, what is the good question? Morocco. Yeah, Morocco, Morocco is, is uh, at 2014, it's, it's supposed to cross this 50 50 point and is not too far behind Tunisia then. And uh, having lived in Morocco myself, I want to say that it's very, <laughs> it seems like a, a very promising place uh, for a transition, perhaps a smooth transition, because it has a king who might orchestrate that transition. And if we know the history of Thailand, that's exactly what happened, um, that uh, the king played off uh, <clears throat> the military against the commercial elite and the students at the time and were able to uh, bring about a smooth transition. I, I hope that's how, what happens in Morocco. Um, China is just a solid uh, authoritarian regime where a political elite actually created the commercial elite and the military elite. It's very difficult to see where the crack is that uh, would ha create something of the likes of Tunisia. The, the population, in fact, has matured quite a bit. I wouldn't suspect, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it would have any trouble being a liberal democracy if allowed to, but I don't, um, I don't think the regime is uh, going to let that happen, and I don't know when it will. <laughs> So, the models for Afghanistan and Iraq, where we're engaged now, the message that the message. What's suggest? the message? Well, the message, if you take a look at the age structure, is that both of those countries uh, don't have a hard time recruiting, and that um, they don't have to recruit from the outside. They can do it from the inside because they have such rapid workforce growth. So you have young people coming up into the ranks, and even if you think you've destroyed an army or destroyed some element of it, here they come again, new ones. So um, uh, I suppose the lesson is that if you want, to, uh, you want to do something in Iraq, and you, you, or, or I say Afghanistan, you have to do what you've done in Iraq. And I guess that's what General Petraeus is intent on. You have to actually recruit those who would be recruited to the other side. You have to win them over. 
Um, and uh, because there's no, it's not like Bosnia where you destroy an army or, or the Serb army, uh, Serb, uh, and you, um, and then they find, then they have trouble finding recruits. They're all over the place. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't you say too? I mean, if you go, if you look at the China example, I mean, one reason maybe. I mean, there are a lot of other reasons why they've had more stability than than your model would would predict. Is that the regime itself is conscious that they have to keep mm. producing jobs? I mean, that is their number one obsession. Um, is really because they are very well aware of, right. uh, in some way of your model. I don't know if you've been telling this or not, but um, <laughs> in some sense uh, they know that um, with uh, what has been a youthful population and these rapid changes that unless they keep um, uh, you know, making the jobs, um, growing the jobs that um, they're in for insecure mm -hmm. or instability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Final word on limiting factors. The last question we had, limiting uh, factors of the model. Yeah, too bad that uh, that lady left because uh, she hit on it actually. Is where does it work? Uh, where is it iffy? Is that um, in countries where there is a divided up population, divided in terms of ethnic groups? And you mentioned two of them actually, Afghanistan and Iraq. In other words, when those those ethnic groups decline. They're like three separate populations. Uh, what's going to happen if one goes first? Will it be the same as the Lebanese situation? Israel's another one. What's happening because you really have a very segmented population? You have um, Haredim, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews that, uh, with fertility rates that are extremely high and, and infant mortality rates are very low. They're growing very rapidly. Uh, you have Israeli Arabs whose fertility is coming down, but they're still uh, growing rapidly. And then you have a, a set of traditional, uh, traditionally religious and secular Jews in the middle that is starting to um, be eclipsed. I won't say eclipsed, squeezed, uh, re reduced as a portion of the total population. And it was those people who actually founded the state that we know of as Israel. Uh, so everywhere there is this divided up population, this very uh, ethnically divided population, you will have um, places where it's very difficult to apply this model. Uh, the other places, uh, countries that have um, a lot of death from AIDS, it's, qu it's questionable how well it does because you have this unusual pattern of adult death. And the third type of place is countries where immigrant labor come in. And I was mentioning the, uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula because if you look at their AIDS structures, the age structure is not telling the story, actually, because it's stocked up with temporary migrants. Uh, if you get below that, if you go to um, get a hold of the native populations, you get a better indication of how far along that population is in the age structural transition and what changes have occurred in terms of uh, human capital accumulation and, and how easy it is to employ them. But it's a, the uh, Gulf states are very strange because they bring in all of this labor, and I think that may create its own tensions in its own times. I don't know how you feel about the GCC states. Well, I, I think there's another factor of, of two that a lot of them are, um, you know, you put in the category maybe of rentier states, mm -hmm. I mean, in that they have a huge amount of resources um, in which they um, um, can, can basically, you know, I hate to say, uh, sound pejorative here, but buy off the opposition. I mean, and we know that that's another trend. It's just not Middle Eastern, but it's a, in other countries too. Um, Angola is one that, that um, where the, the regimes do have. Could, and they also, where your whole economy depends on resource extraction in one way or the other, and which is often tied up with the government. So what you were talking earlier about with, you know, this aging, um, youthful structure, and you have the beginnings of a commercial elite, and so on, who are independent of of um, the state, in a lot of these other countries, so much of the employment and everything society depends upon the state. I think it's a much more mm -hmm. difficult. Um, 
uh, really scenario to see for upheaval. And I think that's probably where your model doesn't work as well mm -hmm. um, as in other cases. Mm -hmm. well, we've, we've about come to the end of the uh, appointed hour. I, I think it's um, uh, very much appreciate you kind of taking the time to walk us through what is a, a technical model in, in terms of um, it doesn't lend itself to the kind of glib political scientist. As a political scientist, <laughs> I didn't take too much offense to all the beating up on, on us. but. Um, uh, but, you know, it takes some time to get through it. Uh, but I think what we've seen today is that even though it is a less familiar tool, uh, 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 political demography, a field that is, uh, has not been as uh, integrated into the kind of analysis um, that this town, Washington, and, and others are, are doing in a foreign policy context, in a security policy context, um, that it really bears um, uh, paying attention to. And, and suggests uh, uh, some different ways that we can understand the challenges that, um, and the opportunities uh, that are presented um, in this realm. I should say, as a bit of an advertisement on April 1st, in fact, with Rich Sincata's help, we've had um, uh, the opportunity to schedule with Andy Mason and Ron Lee, two people who really developed uh, the, the kind of notion of this demographic dividend and, and, and bonus to uh, come talk about this. So we'll continue this conversation uh, here at the center in, in just a few days and hope that all of you will find um, these resources, including Richard's work and, and Matt's work, uh, online here at the, the Wilson Center's website and on our blog, New Security Beat. Hope you all uh, contribute to that and, and find uh, more discussion of this there. So Matt, Rich, thank you so much for your insights. Thanks everyone for some good questions. Please join me in thanking them for a session today.